Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Yale Farber's play Amajuba, like doves we rise. Um, so this is, uh, I'm reading this out of the collection Theater as Witness, which are testimonial plays. Um, so these three plays collected in this edition, um, each of them works with the material from actual testimonies from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa after the fall of apartheid. Um, the other two plays in this book, um, A Woman in Waiting and He Left Quietly, tell individual stories, but Amajuba tells five people's stories. It's a, it's a sort of episodic play going through their different experiences of oppression, dispossession, um, isolation, etc., under the apartheid regime. So the the five people who testified and then subsequently acted in the initial edition of this: uh, Carlo Chokwe, Ralph Matlala, Ongeka Mpongwana, Philip Tipo uh, Tindisa. And Jabulil Chabala. Um, I, I say the initial version of this because this these are plays that are based on real people's actual lived experience. Farber worked with those people to shape these these uh, testimonies into a theatrical form. And then they were performed by the people who had lived those experiences and given that testimony. So, uh, at some point during the sort of performance runs uh, of of this initial, well, let me let me look at this the specifics here. Um, the production experienced two cast member replacements during these years. That's. Um, in 2002 to 2004, I believe, uh, which, due to its biographical nature, changed the text substantially each time. The integrity of Amajuba is based on the premise that Farber would rework the text to accommodate the new testimony of any new cast member with the core concept and remaining testimonies were untouched. So basically, when one of the performers had to leave the production for whatever reason, um, they would be replaced with someone new, but that person would not tell the other person's story. They would not appropriate the story of the person who had left. They would tell their own story, and Farber and the, the rest of the cast members would work with that material to sort of fit it into the existing play. So it's a dynamic play that's Really, as with all of these plays, all of these testimonial plays, it is really rooted in giving the experience of the speaker not just as a performer, but as a human being. So, really, really unique in that sense, because most other sort of testimonial plays or like verbatim theater, things like that, they they don't do that. There's no pretense that the person saying the lines is the person who had that particular experience. And so this sort of verisimilitude between the performer and the material is really, really unique. So um, this is, again, a, a really dynamic anti-apartheid play, but sort of looking back on apartheid. So not anti-apartheid in the way that, say, 1960s, 70s, 80s theater directly critiqued it, obviously, but looking back on what life was like for young people, particularly in the 1980s, um, and the, the prologue really opens with this thematic, introducing us to this idea that these are, these are memory plays and that um, there is this sense of 
this complex sense of loss, of nostalgia, and that loss is rooted in the experience of apartheid itself. That loss, that sense of mourning, of the loss of childhood, of innocence, really, um, is rooted in the experience of apartheid violence, dispossession, racism, etc., etc. So, I'll read you the whole prologue. It's a bit, it's a bit lengthy. It's about two pages, but I think it's worth it. Um, so the stage directions start out. A single voice in the dark sings. Song is a repeated element of this uh, of this play. The company's voice rise in response. It is a call and refrain popularly sung by the young comrades of the political struggle in South Africa during the turbulent 80s. This refrain is repeated indefinitely during this prologue. Lights rise on five performers standing in large enamel bowls, each illuminated by a single ray of light. The effect is evocative and intimate. The song continues gently under the spoken text, which is addressed directly to the audience. Bongi starts uh, with longing, says, All my life I've waited for a moment when the future would arrive. As a girl, I knew that someday the present would be the past, and I wanted the present to pass. I wanted the past to be the past, a country I would never have to visit again. From dust we came, and to dust shall we return, never to pass this way again. And Jabu, gently smiling at the memory, says, Everything was so much simpler when I was a child, like washing myself. All I had to do was sit there and let Mama and the water do the work. But things change. The train pulls out of each station, forever going forward, and home is nowhere but in your memories. And Tipo says, growing up in the townships, washing was no simple matter. All we had were these small anyana, I mean small bowls, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't reach around to clean my back. With a smile and a wink, he says, so I decided to forget what's behind me and concentrate on making my front look good. Rolf says, I remember the day I realized I was growing. I couldn't fit in the bowl anymore. I understood then that someday I would be a man, and washing was never going to be simple again. But year by year, the memories gather like dust until we feel we will never be clean. And stage direction says the singing swells as the cast gather, uh, stand and gather the bowls of water. They maintain the song as they move the enamel bowls to the periphery of the stage, forming a border around the playing area. The cast gathers center stage. The singing continues beneath the following. Chalo says, We come from a time and place that we would rather forget. We are the lost generation of our country, where everyone has a story to tell, and most would rather forget. There is nothing special about our stories, but tonight we will tell them, for somewhere beneath the dust is the past. And until we go and claim each broken piece, we will never be free. And then the song resolves. Um, and yeah, so these five performers each tell their story in sequence. Um, there is, they're, they're run through with um, songs, they're run through with a sort of mixture of exposition in which the performer directly tells us the things that happen and performance in which the other actors take on the roles of people around that speaker. Um, but what's interesting about it, again, as opposed to the other two plays in this collection, which tell one person's story, is that we get a really dynamic picture of the violence and the deprivations of apartheid. Um, Bongi tells her story first. Uh, her story is basically about poverty and the lack of opportunities, the lack of... Um, and the lack of communal support in this sort of broken town in which she grew up. Um, her I think it was her father had run off first, then her mother abandoned her and her sister, um, and then finally her sister left, and she concludes, or nearly concludes, there's a little bit after this, but mostly this is toward the end of her story, and at eight years old, I was abandoned. From then on, everyone in the village knew it. In the Mopongwa household uh, house on the outskirts of the village, there was a little girl living there on her own. 
And it is really this story of isolation, of suffering, of deprivation, of never having enough food, of, um, of not being, uh, of the shame of having to beg for even basic sustenance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the next person who tells their story is Rolf. And Rolf is colored, which in was colored in the racial schema of apartheid. Um, blacks were full-blooded South Africans. So, the various ethnicities, nations of pre-colonial South Africa, the Zulu, the Hossa, uh, etc., etc., people who were full-blooded whatever nation or ethnicity they were from. Coloreds were mixed race, typically black and white. Um, not always, necessarily. The other big category was Indian, which was sort of any, I think, South Asians, but I think it also sort of honorarily included East Asians and, and anybody else who sort of didn't fit otherwise into the racial schema. It was really designed to divide people of indigenous African descent from white Europeans, uh, people of white European descent. So Rolf is colored. He, he has some white ancestry, um, but he, his mother is uh, Petty, uh, which is a particular ethnicity in South Africa. So uh, Rolf's Rolf's trouble really comes from being in this sort of marginalized position. And, and ironically enough, the sort of violence, the, the antagonism that he experiences is from the other petty children who, who sort of reject him as an outcast. Um, there's a lot of anti-colored racial, racial slurs in this portion. Um, but he talks about this sort of difficult experience of constantly being bullied by the other children, uh, constantly being beaten by his school principal or headmistress, whatever the whatever the term is. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and and this sort of constant experience of racial degradation over his identity. Tipo's story comes next. Um, he had a very happy family life, but then the family was forced to move out of their home um, into this other area because the area that they had been living in was being sort of restricted to people of that particular ethnic group. And Tipo's family was a different ethnic group, so they were they were moved into government housing elsewhere. Um, and Tipo had been the one in the family who was responsible for um, basically taking care of his his mother and father when they became elderly, and so he was very much like his life and identity very much centered around his relationship with his parents. And so that made it extremely difficult when his father ended up leaving. Uh, he, Tipo says here, maybe Papa had made up his mind to leave us long ago. Maybe families are not meant to be put under such pressure by relocating. I don't know who's to blame. All I know is when we left, left Garangua, that's the place that they were relocated from, if that wasn't clear from context, Part of my father stayed there. He would spend weekends there, and less and less time with us in Sashwangu. Sashwangu. Sorry. Um, I may not be pronouncing these place names right. If I'm not, I apologize, by the way. Um, and so he deals with that, and, and his father abandon, abandons the family. Then when his mother files for divorce, the father returns and... Uh, basically tries to reassert his authority, but the the sons, including Tipo, sort of stand up to him and, and drive him out of the house. 
um, which was a very traumatic experience for Tipo because, again, his relationship with his parents was deeply, deeply formative for him. The next person we get is Jabu. Um, her story is quite brutal, quite violent, because she grows up uh, in a place called Zola, which is a um, an area of Soweto, one of the suburbs, I think, of Johannesburg, one of the most sort of violent and dangerous and impoverished areas in South Africa. Um, and there is a, a gang leader who, when she's about 13, becomes sexually interested in her. She rejects him and he threatens to rape and murder her. Um, and so she flees Zola. Uh, she, she leaves her neighborhood. But then she learns not that long after that that her um, her half-brother, I can't remember exactly what the relationship is. Um, oh, her cousin and her uncle um, are both killed in street violence. And so she has to sort of deal with the, the trauma of losing these people who were very close to her in her family. Um, and then the last storyteller is Chalo. Uh, and he is the most directly involved in anti-apartheid resistance. Um, he's sort of slowly drawn into the struggle for freedom, but he then becomes very, very active. And he participates, he both participates in and experiences violence. Um, his best friend, uh, there's, a, there's a, a demonstration um, in the, I think it's the North Pretoria Riot Squad, which is a really notoriously violent um police organization enforcing apartheid uh, attacks them and Charlo's best friend is captured by the North Pretoria riot squad. He and a number of other people are basically taken and extrajudicially executed. Um, the, the police hang them um, and they're not their bodies aren't found for for days maybe weeks um afterwards and the but it, but it's not as simple as that because that if that were the story it would be a simple case of the evil of apartheid but this is a a play about the complexity of apartheid and so charlo recounts how um they, d they decided that a particular person in the organization had sold them out to the police, and so they forced that person into a tire, doused them with gasoline or kerosene, pe uh, petrol, whatever it is, and light them on fire as, as punishment for the betrayal. And so Chalo, on the one hand, is this, this sort of victim, this freedom fighter, uh, who suffers tremendously at the, the hands of the apartheid regime. But his story also reflects the violence, the danger of, that, that was part of the resistance itself. So ultimately, it is a complicated play with a lot of moving parts, a lot of dynamics that make this very, very difficult but also extremely informative about the complex nature of apartheid and reactions to it.